how you doing? It's good to have you back for our study in First and Second Peter. This is the fifth of our series, and uh, we're going to be talking today about First Peter 2, verses 1 through 12. Uh, I want to summarize just where we've been so far and uh, point out that the, from, from chapter 1, verse 1, through the end of the passage that we're looking at today, verse 12 of chapter 2, that that seems to serve as an introductory section to the rest of the letter. And that may seem like he's taking a long time uh, or a, a lot of material to uh, use as introduction, given the fact that 1 Peter only has five chapters. But what he has to say uh, in these early sections is important and foundational for us to understand what he's going to say the rest of the way. And what he does in chapter 1 is he assures these people that they have a living hope of eternal life, that because of Christ's resurrection, they can be sure uh, of their own eternal life and their own salvation. He uh, underscores the idea that we can be confident that our salvation is secure, that it's been guarded by God, that we don't keep ourselves saved, that we can't lose our salvation, that God has given it to us and, and in no way can it be taken from us. And he uses several words there at the beginning of chapter 1 to explain why uh, our salvation is secure and, and how it is secure. In the middle part of chapter 1, he uh, issues a call to us to live holy lives. We as Christians, uh, especially in the last hundred years or so, but probably going back all through church history, we've come up with our lists. Uh, maybe you grew up in a more fundamentalist type church as, as I did. And I'm glad for the church background that I had. But there was this, especially as a young person, there was a list of things that if you didn't do them, you were kind of considered a good Christian. A good Christian doesn't do this and doesn't do this and doesn't do this and doesn't do that. I mean, back in my day, it was you don't go to the movies, you don't listen to rock music, you don't, uh, I mean, even, even goofy things like uh, how long we wore our hair and uh, you know, the way that we dressed, well, that's certainly an indicator of our heart sometimes. The, the rules were external things. And the idea was that this is what a holy person looks like. And really, that's very, very short-sighted because holiness means to be set apart for God's purposes. And that includes not only avoiding things that are bad, but it means embracing the things that are good and living for God's glory. So he calls us to holiness because God is holy. And then at the end of the chapter, he tells us that we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, as we begin chapter 2 this morning, or, well, it's the afternoon while I'm taping it, so I don't know what time you're watching this, but as we begin chapter 2, um, I want to look at verses 1 through 3 just briefly before we look at the rest of the chapter. So I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so follow along as I read verses 1 through 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, you know that the chapter and verse divisions that we have in our contemporary Bibles were not, uh, did not come with the originals. In other words, Peter didn't sit down and say, okay, verse 1. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, and then write the number two and go on from there. They were inserted at a later time in order to help people find places in Scripture, and they are very, very valuable. Uh, my understanding is that the chapters were added in the mid-13th century and that the verses were added uh, approximately three centuries later. So it's only been relatively recently in the context of church history that people have been able to open a Bible and reference a place by chapter and verse. That's why you'll never read a portion of the New Testament where the apostles are quoting from the Old Testament, and they say, remember what is said in Isaiah 8-2, or something like that. They didn't have those divisions at that point. Uh, and what happens sometimes is that uh, the people who did this tried very hard to make sure that the divisions made sense and went in the right places, but there are times when you might say, you know, I, I could argue with that a little bit. And for me, anyway, this is one of those places. It seems to me 
that verses one through three fit better with what he's been saying in chapter one than they do with what he's going to be saying in chapter two. And I say that because he's issued this call to, um, to love each other, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love each other earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, excuse me, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word that was, this word is the good news that was preached to you. Now don't stop because of that big number two, okay? So, seems like he's continuing his thought. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Some translations have said the pure milk of the word. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So he's saying that if a person has tasted that the Lord is good, which is a synonymous for saying that if you're a believer, he says put away all these different things because you have been born again through the living word of God and it has taught you to love. And certainly the qualities in chapter 2, verse 1, are qualities that need to be set aside if love relationships are to exist between the family of God, people in the family of God. Okay? So I'm not going to say a whole lot about that. Um, it's much like what Paul says in Ephesians 4, um, because Paul uses this idea of putting off and putting on uh, several times. And in Ephesians, let me just get there a second. Ephesians chapter 4, for example, and verses 22 through 24, he says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The, the former manner of life gets put aside. We grow in our understanding of the word and put on the new self, which directs us in different ways. And I think that's what Peter's saying here. God's word remains forever. It's always alive, always trustworthy, and always directs our path. And if we're going to love each other in Christ the way that we're supposed to, we need to submit ourselves to that ever-living word, and we need to put away qualities that would be damaging to relationships. Okay, so having said that, I want to look at uh, the rest of the chapter, uh, well, at least verses 4 through 12, and look at what Peter says about our identity. My father-in-law was a evangelist, and he and his brother used to uh, uh, hold evangelistic conferences. They did tent meetings way back in the day, okay, in the 60s and probably 70s. Uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, after they, they graduated from school. And they would go into a town and work with churches or a particular church, and they would set up a tent in a big field or on the church property, and they would have evangelistic meetings for a week or two. And um, we don't have that happening much more anymore, probably because we've become so accustomed to air conditioning. But uh, that, was, that was a big event, a big deal in the life of a small community or a town, probably they went through New York and Ohio and Pennsylvania and places like that. Well, one day, oh, I should insert this. It was common for people to invite the visiting evangelists to come for a meal. And on a Sunday, when they were going to be going after church to somebody's house for lunch, they took separate cars. Dad took one car, his brother took another car. And his brother arrived at the house that they were supposed to go to and knocked at the door, and the door was opened, and he went in. And uh, he didn't smell any food cooking, but he figured, well, that would come, didn't know what they were doing. And he said, oh, you have an organ. And he went and sat down and started playing the organ and singing and just having a great time. And this went on for a little while, at least. And finally, the, the couple came out of their kitchen and said, Sir, who are you? He had gone to the wrong house. But that is a good question to ask. Who are you? 
And in terms of our relationship with God, it's a good question to review. It's a good thing to consider. Who are we in relationship to God? And who are we just in terms of the world that we live in? Um, I think the answer, though, to that question, if we are believers, always has to come from this understanding of who we are in Christ. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a husband. I have other functions in life, and I certainly, certainly who I am as a person is defined to some degree by those things. But ultimately, who I am is based upon the relationship that I have with God through Jesus Christ. And the same is true with you. And in chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, uh, Peter answers this question. Uh, so let's read beginning in chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice, ex sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, for whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now there's some great imagery there about Jesus being the chosen cornerstone. And he goes back into the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and talks about uh, passages where uh, Christ is called the, the cornerstone and the stone that the builders rejected. But um, I think that the point that he's making here is that God is building a community of worshipers with Jesus as the cornerstone of that building. And we were over in Ephesians a few minutes ago. I'd like you to just go back there for a minute and look at chapter 2. Because again, this is uh, part of what I think Peter is, is saying. You know, uh, there's a place in 2 Peter toward the end of the letter where Peter talks about the importance of listening to what Paul has written. So it's likely that he had access to some of the things that Paul has written, and it's possible that he had access to the book of Ephesians, and he borrows from Paul using the imagery that Paul uses in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, nope, sorry, wrong, wrong chapter. Um, okay, I'm back. I cut for a minute. Tim Hogan told me that if I make a mistake uh, like you would make in a Sunday school class, to not worry about it and just keep going, let the camera keep rolling. But I needed a moment to find out where, where I was supposed to be headed because I wrote the wrong reference down in my notes. But we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 18. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And again, listen to what Peter says, beginning in verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You hear the similarity there, okay? And um, the idea, again, is that God is building a community of worshipers with Jesus as the cornerstone of that building. So instead of letting themselves be defined by the fact that they were being marginalized, as they probably were, uh, this, is, this is a time when the Christians were either being persecuted or were at the beginning stages of some opposition. So instead of letting them be defined by their being marginalized or being disrespected or even mistreated by the culture that they lived in, Peter reminds them who they are in God's eyes. And the same is true for us. So when we ask the question, who are you? Peter answers it in verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's who we are in Christ. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And it may be that we live in a world that doesn't see us that way. And certainly our answer isn't to say, well, you're making fun of me, but I'm a child of God. That's not the point that Peter's driving at. Peter's trying to get them to understand that just as, as life is just a blink in the scope of eternity, that being marginalized or mistreated here in life, it's, it's only for a short time compared to the eternity that we have where we serve as God's priests and a chosen race and a holy nation. And while we're here on earth, that we proclaim his excellencies, that we, we sing about how great God is, we may tell people about how great God is in both evangelism and as we share what God has done in our lives, we proclaim God's excellencies when we read his word or preach and teach his word. On Sunday, our little kids over in, in Calvary Kids are hearing about the excellencies of God. And that's our job right now while we're here on this planet until Jesus comes for us is to function in that role as God continues to add to the number of believers and complete that house. Now, in the first Roots video, which some of you may be watching, Roots is a series of seven-minute videos in which I'm uh, discussing theology, going somewhat slow through things, but uh, trying to talk about what Bible doctrines uh, mean and how they apply to our lives. In the first of the Roots series, going back a couple weeks, I talked about the fact that our purpose, our reason for existence, is to bring God glory and praise. And I believe that that's what Peter is saying in this particular section, in verse 9, the second half, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's our purpose, to bring God glory. Okay? And that's the reason for his application in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, he's talked about that already, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, among unsafe people, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So who are we? Well, we're God's chosen people. We're part of the building that God is building ultimately for his glory. And we demonstrate that by the way that we live, by what we say about God that reflects positively on who God is and what he means to us, and by making sure that we avoid the lifestyle that we may have had before we were believers, and certainly the things that characterize what Peter calls the Gentile culture, which is uh, a way of sinful uh, living um, that, uh, as he says, wages war against our soul. And we do that because our job is to bring God glory. So who are you? You're a child of God, and you exist on this planet to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So who are you? Well, you're a child of God. You're a precious child of God, and you're here on this planet until Jesus calls you home in one way or another that you might and I might bring glory to God and praise him for what he has done for us. That's our identity. We'll see you next week.